Okay, good to go. Uh, very good morning to all of you who join us from Brazil today and uh, good afternoon to all of you who are in, in the UK. Once again, the Tax Committee of the Brazilian Chamber of Commerce brings to our members and friends a very important topic. This time on incentives being offered in the United Kingdom to startups with the key consideration as to whether Brazilian companies and Brazilian investors can benefit from them. The UK is renowned for being investment friendly. There are incentives over here for businesses that are beginning their lives, which range from uh, government to private grants, such as those provided by angels and uh, venture capitalists, which allows companies to uh, create their business plans, to conduct research, and in short, to get their businesses going in their crucial initial phase. And there are, as we will hear today, set tax incentives too. Our speakers today comprise specialists from the DIT, the Department for Trade and Industry of the British government, as well as lawyers and accountants who are highly experienced on this matter, both in Brazil and in the United Kingdom. So uh, I am sure that uh, today we will have a, a highly informative webinar to those who want to establish a business in the United Kingdom. But before, before we start, just a, a short word about the, the Brazilian Chamber of Commerce. We are celebrating this year our 80th anniversary. It is uh, 80 years supporting and uh, promoting bilateral investments and trade relations between Brazil and the United Kingdom. We have more than 80 members in different areas our members are in Brazil and in the United Kingdom. So if you are in Brazil, you can also be a member of the chamber. And you can uh, join one of our committees. Besides the uh, tax committees, we have the energy and the carbonization committee, the legal, the banking and fintech. And uh, we want to be a, a very inclusive uh, chamber. So I encourage you to join. So uh, uh, having said that, and uh, going back to, uh, to our webinar of today, before we start, and oh, as I always do, I would like to uh, say a few words about our housekeeping rules, which are the following. I would ask you please to keep your microphone muted and camera switched off during the webinar. There will be a Q&A session today so you can ask your questions via the team box. You can type them in and send them in, but they will be answered at the end of uh, the, our webinar. Um, also, I would note that uh, this webinar is being recorded and uh, in the next coming days, uh, we will have uh, the webinar will be posted in uh, the Chamber's uh, website and social media platforms. So with that said, I would like to call the first of uh, our speaker, Mr. Martin Whaley. Martin is uh, Executive Director for Trade and Investment Brazil from the UK Government's Department for Trade, for International Trade, the DIT. And uh, he is joined by Mrs. Julia Koch, who is uh, Business Development Manager for Inward Investment in Brazil, also from the UK Government's DIT. Martin, please. Veda, thank you. Good to see you again. Uh, bom dia uh, to the mundo uh, in Brazil. Batadi for those of you in the UK. I'm Martin, as Veda says. I'm the Director for Trade and Investment at the British Consulate uh, in Sao Paulo, which is where I am at the moment. Um, so thank you for uh, inviting me to speak briefly at this event. So my role at the British Diplomatic Mission in Brazil is to strengthen the economic links between Brazil and the UK. And that breaks down roughly into, into three areas. The first area is working with British companies who already have a presence in Brazil or are looking to expand and invest into Brazil or sell to Brazil. And we help them to find opportunities and to make the most of them. The second area is around the policy area. Uh, so we work very hard to make the trading environment between the UK and Brazil 
easier and simpler so that doing business and making investments between our two countries is is easier that includes all sorts of different things um, but two examples would be um, we're looking to start negotiating as soon as possible both a free trade agreement and also a double taxation agreement both of which will make uh, P, uh, business people's lives easier between the UK and Brazil. And then the third area we work on is a subject of today's session, today's event, which is working with Brazilian companies and Brazilian investors e who either have a presence in the UK or are looking to invest in the UK. And that area of work is, is really broad. Um, for example, we work with major Brazilian brands such as Itaú, uh, XP Investimentos, Natura, and we also work with smaller startups and all sorts of different types of investment, including venture capital. So the links between our two countries in, a, in an economic sense aren't as strong as they should be based upon a, a, an analysis of the size of our two economies. There's not as much trade or investment between us as we'd either like or expect. And there's a lot of reasons um, behind that. One of them we think is basically a lack of understanding on both sides of the other. Um, and part of that is due to, for example, a very low number of British people living in Brazil and helping uh, Brits back home understand Brazil. And it's only recently that there's a decent sized Brazilian diaspora in the UK helping Brazilians You're understand the, um, the UK. Um, so someone's just not muted there. Um, so it's great to be part of this event today to help um, deal with some of that lack of, of, of awareness of each other and to help fill in some of those gaps. So why should a Brazilian investor consider the UK? Uh, there are lots of reasons, all of which are linked to the business environment. Um, and the UK business environment is set up to make it as easy as possible to do business and to grow and to reduce bureaucracy and all the related unnecessary costs. Now, for example, our regulatory and legal systems make it both simple to operate in the UK and easy to manage a global business from there. Setting up a business and the, all of the admin associated with it, from paying tax, hiring talented workers, um, resolving disputes is quick and easy in the UK. And all of this means that the UK is firmly in the top 10 of the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index. It's also easy to raise money. The UK is the best place in Europe to raise funds. It's also the best place in Europe and the third place in the world for scale-up investment uh, behind just the, the US and China. And this isn't surprising. We have Europe's most active funding markets and in 2020 attracted an investment worth $13.7 billion. And then for tech business, the environment is even better. Over 60% of investment into UK tech comes from outside of the UK. And the UK is the first country in Europe to reach 100 tech unicorns, with more tech unicorns than Germany, France and the Netherlands combined. And in terms of tech unicorns, we're again just behind the US and China. Then um, UK startups and scale-ups raised a record 10.7 billion in 2020 and at the same time 13.7 billion dollars was raised in 2020 venture capital investment which is a third of Europe's total and more than Germany and France combined. Um, as well as those benefits of the UK economy there's also the um, support available from the UK government and in particular the Department for International Trade uh, for which I'm working here in Brazil. And one of our programmes is called the Global Entrepreneur Programme. This is our flagship programme for international entrepreneurs and it helps international business founders outside the UK maximise their potential inside the UK. Participants are mentored by uh, an experienced deal maker and they get help from everything from developing a business plan to prospective um, in introductions to pr uh, prospective investors. And they also receive, receive support through an alumni academy to make the most of the UK's ecosystem. Uh, at, until now, the Global Entrepreneur Programme has enabled nearly 1,000 ambitious 
internationally mobile entrepreneurs to set up and make the most of the UK. So I'm happy to talk about that. And also, as you look at your uh, your options for overseas um, operations and having an overseas presence, as you consider the UK, I'd be delighted to talk in more detail about the opportunities there, as with my colleague Julia, who is also on the call, and we will put our contacts in the chat. Um, so I think that's it from me. So thanks very much for the invitation. Enjoy the rest of, the, of, of today's event and obrigado. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin. Um, can I, let me see if I can activate the camera here. There you go. Um, okay. The, Hello. Hello. Yeah, all good. Okay. Yeah, I'm uh, trying to connect with the camera here. We can well, see well, you. The camera's working. Can you see me? Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you very much, Martin. Uh, congratulations on the fantastic work. Uh, on attracting uh, uh, Brazilian entrepreneurs to the UK to, to, to do business in the UK in this fantastic environment and ecosystem. Thank you also, Vera, for the kind words. Uh, what a great honor to have you uh, in our webinar today. Um, so uh, we'll now uh, focus on the tax issues. I'll comment on Brazilian taxation as a means to compare with uh, uh, the subsequent information uh, we'll hear about on uh, UK taxation, the tax rules applicable to, to startups. So if questions arise, um, uh, uh, please type and check in, in the chat box and, uh, and uh, with your, ideally with your name and also the uh, entity you represent so we can know who's, uh, uh, who's there. And uh, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of this uh, today's webinar, uh, and we'll uh, try to address uh, the, the questions that have been raised. Um, so, <laughs> try to share, okay. So can you uh, uh, have access to the to the uh, presentation already? Yes, we do. OK, thank you. Right. So let's make it uh, <clears throat> quick. Uh, I'll start with an overview of Brazilian corporate income and revenue uh, taxation. There are three ascertainment regimes. Lucro real for large companies turn over uh, higher than 78 million reais per year. Uh, lucro presumido for those uh, below this threshold and Simplish, which is targeted for small companies uh, um, and uh, up to uh, uh, 4.8 million uh, uh, reais turnover per year. Other conditions also apply, such as uh, a company will not be eligible to Simplish if it has uh, legal entities among its shareholders. So it's, uh, usually in practice, uh, startups typically uh, are within Simplish or lucro presumido. And this means that uh, there are lower corporate income and revenue taxes uh, rates. However, they fall on operational revenue. There's no ascertainment of net profit for tax purposes. And this means that uh, this, this regime, simply and lucro presumido, entail the disregard of any expenses, costs, losses, input tax credits. This is already a, a problem there because, of, as you know, startups take a while to develop and to start uh, generating uh, profit. But according to Brazilian tax rules for small companies, uh, the tax is owed even on revenue, even if the company has losses and zero profits. It, it's, a, it's one downside already there. The other uh, downside from this feature of uh, absence 
in in a recognition of uh, uh, losses, expenses, etc., is this: um, the piece of legislation we have in Brazil uh, with a targeted tax incentives for innovation and technological innovation. These incentives, as you can read here, uh, uh, few of them really apply to startups because. Uh, the deductibility of that profit ascertainment or perspective are in the expenses, full depreciation, accelerated amortization of intangibles. This is this simply does not apply to companies under the of middle and, and simply. So the remaining incentives you find in this piece of legislation could be some somehow useful for startups. Uh, the, but again, they they, rely, they 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 also focus on disbursement for purchase of equipment or uh, registration of IP abroad. And uh, also, again, this is not in practice used. Uh, uh, actually, uh, according to a survey published by Deloitte very recently, these features are not used for most companies, even, even large companies, because of uh, uh, extreme uh, compliance required to abide by this regime and uh, severe penalties in case of any minor infringement. So. What happens in practice, startups are taxed in Brazil like any other small and big uh, enterprise. Um, no uh, uh, tax incentives to founders. Uh, taxation is on cash basis or for natural persons. And on salary, you have income and, and pay, payroll taxes burdening it. There is a feature in Brazilian tax law of zero tax on dividends, but this requires profitability, which is not the case of startups in general, uh, at least in the early uh, years. Um, and the disposal of shares triggers capital gains tax from 15 to 22.5%. This is on tires, a progressive rate. 15% tax applies to up to 5 million reais uh, capital gains. There's no cap tax incentive specific for venture capital investment as well. Uh, uh, capital gains, if ascertained by a legal entity, are subject to corporate income tax at 34%, uh, actually to the ascertainment of, uh, of the, the, the respective tax period. Um, and if in case of a fund, typically it's 15% tax. And also there's no specific tax intensive incentive to talent. Quite opposite, the Brazilian revenue holds a stock option to be taxable as salary. Uh, so you have income and payroll taxes falling on upon vesting. And then upon disposal, you would have, according to the revenues view, uh, capital gains taxation uh, on the difference between the value of the vesting and the sales value at the end of the day. So really not uh, uh, quite the opposite of incentives, in fact. So the typical domestic scenario we would have is uh, a, a founder incorporates a limitada. It is a, a, a more simple type of incorporation of a company in Brazil. The other one would be uh, the Sociedade Anonima, or like a corporation with uh, higher compliance, also better governance, but also higher compliance. So usually the creation of a, a, the incorporation of Limitada, there's no tax outcome there, just some minor uh, capital uh, uh, to, to, to set up the company. Then you have possibly uh, angels and VC funds bringing in cash via equity or convertible debt. Again, no tax out outcome there. Uh, the, even if some dilution is involved because the founder is subject to tax on a cash basis, so far his asset, namely the shares of x -Tech, are still there at cost value, so no tax outcome there. Uh, then talent, again, you can have uh, uh, some talent acquired retained, retained via stock option. Uh, in view of the revenue, there is tax, so I leave a question mark there, well, because this is still not settled in jurisprudence at final jurisprudential level. Uh, then what happens when, the, when this structure is mature, the company has grown, uh, these uh, equity structure uh, matures, and then exit takes place. Exit happens, a buyer will acquire the shares of the company and will pay uh, the stakeholders for their, their equity at that point. And uh, this will trigger a uh, capital gains tax uh, right there. Uh, okay, however, if, if the company is willing to access to tap into international funds, uh, uh, what happens is that uh, global, global capture, uh, venture capital investors, they, they do not invest directly in Brazil. It's too uh, risky and it, it brings exposure for them. So their preferred jurisdictions have more stable jurisprudence in pro-business legislation, including governance features. And uh, this uh, uh, determines Brazilian startups aiming at accessing global funding to uh, restructure or to structure originally uh, internationally. And these international structures often enable deferral of capital gains taxation. A typical situation is this one known as the Cayman sandwich 
or the Cayman flip, in which uh, the, the cap table, the angels, founders, talents are on top of a Cayman hold co, which is a single owner of a Delaware LLC, which is a single owner of uh, the Brazilian uh, operational entity. Um, what I want to point out here is just that uh, because a, a founder and, and, and some of the cap table still is resident in Brazil for tax, still the same rules apply. Tax applies in Brazil on capital gains just the same as it would uh, uh, otherwise in case of a domestic structure. Meaning that even if the sale takes place uh, at the Delaware level and, and they, the, the uh, payment is earned by Camel Hold Co., uh, this entity will merely block by, by holding the cash there, will merely block the, uh, the, the, the cash being available for the Brazilian founder, for instance, and that would trigger uh, 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 whenever that happens, whenever the cash ultimately falls in the hands of the Brazilian founder that would trigger uh, the recognition of capital gains in Brazil anyway. So possible international scenario involved in the UK. Of course, international, uh, same risk exposure version, same governance drivers. However, uh, what the UK offers are tax incentives targeted to startups and venture capital that indeed foster attraction of businesses and investors there. So the scenario proposed or possible would be this one. Um, of, course, of course, it implies at some point, at some stage, uh, the, the, the Brazilian founder having to, to reside uh, in the UK for tax purposes and relinquish Brazilian uh, tax residence. But this would enable tapping into this fantastic ecosystem available in the UK uh, of talent, of uh, uh, angels and VC funds, and, and, and grow the Brazilian company through UK investment. Uh, we believe it's possible in this situation also, uh, in, and conversely to what happens in the Cayman sandwich that requires full ownership of these uh, holding companies. We believe it's possible that in this case, uh, the Brazilian founder could hold the, uh, a minor percentage up to 10% of the shares of, of the Brazilian company. And this could enable an interesting feature of effective payment of dividends uh, uh, without taxation in Brazil, and as we will see, uh, uh, possibly without taxation in the UK as well. But again, of course, this is no tax advice. It's just a conceptual analysis of the uh, legal framework. Let's now hear from, about the UK tax regime and uh, afterwards about the UK tax incentive tax targeted to uh, startups and VC uh, from the experts. I please invite Fernanda Ellis, Chartered Accountant in the UK and uh, practitioner of law in Brazil to share uh, her views with us today. Okay, hello. Can everyone hear me? Is it all fine? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. I'd like to thank Verenes. Uh, this is a wonderful afternoon, morning for everyone in Brazil for always making the Brazilian Chamber an amazing mm -hmm. place to network, cooperate and have discussions like this. And uh, Gustavo Braga for organizing and then all Malcolm J Joy, jo Jonathan Clark that I'm going to speak in a, Looking forward to hearing their presentation today. And again, the Department of International Trade, uh, Julia Koch and Martin Wally for supporting us uh, with this discussion. Okay, and all the participants, I can see we have lots of uh, participants here. It's always a pleasure. I'll share my presentation. Um, let me know if, if it's working. Can everyone see the presentation? Not yet, Fernando. Um, I tested earlier and it worked. No, cannot. Um, it's not being shown. So share. What about now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Yes. Good okay. Now. Yeah. So, like uh, Gustavo kindly introduced, I'm a UK chartered accountant and uh, UK. Um, I have also done many legal courses in the UK and I have a law firm here. And then I'm a solicitor in Brazil. I have a lobby in Brazil and work with accountants there. So I have uh, years of experience dealing with 
tax and legal matters between Brazil and UK. So I sometimes I, I love to work in cooperation with solicitors and accountants just to make sure that the tax elements work and they integrate. And the part that I really like to assist is how people as individuals can make decisions because sometimes we put some, some things on a, on a structure, but as an investor, uh, their lifestyle uh, also need to be considered. And as well as the UK being an attractive country for companies to set up here, I can guarantee it's a lot easier to open a company and to run a company in the UK than in Brazil. People also choose to come to the UK because of the lifestyle. Uh, they want to raise children, send to the schooling system, uh, they send children to British schools. So they can also consider how does that work if they become UK tax residents. And UK has a very attractive regime for people who come from abroad and they may have income in more than one country. So that's something that I quite like to integrate. Uh, our firm does support people with a life abroad. So if they are going to invest in the UK, they might consider uh, at which point should I invest? Should I become tax resident in the UK before I leave Brazil? Should I send the money prior to that happening? We can uh, look into that in more detail. I'm not going to speak about Brazilian tax residents now because it's not really the topic of this specific um, presentation, but I write a lot about Brazilian tax residents and Saída Definitiva which is when you're no longer tax resident in Brazil, you do a tax exit in Brazil on a blog. So if that's something you'd like to uh, look into, I suggest have a look at the blog because being UK tax resident does not mean that you're no longer Brazilian tax resident. It may happen that someone is tax resident in both countries. And if that's the case, we need to consider would, uh, would the dividends be taxed in the UK, in Brazil? How does that play? Uh, because there is no double taxation treaty uh, to avoid double taxation treaty between Brazil and UK, it may happen that people are tax residents in the UK and tax residents in Brazil. So once they do their saída definitiva from Brazil, once they do the tax exit in Brazil, then any income that they generate from the UK or how they extract dividends from a UK company is no longer reported in Brazil. Uh, so it's quite something to take into consideration that there is no treaty between both countries, but fortunately there is unilateral relief. So if someone happens to be tax resident in Brazil and tax resident in the UK at the same time, and they are taxed in the UK on UK income, they can get credit relief, they can get tax credits in Brazil on the taxes they have paid in the UK. So it's something that is worth mentioning that there is no treaty, but any tax that is paid on a personal level in the UK, we can uh, put that on the Imposto de Renda, Declaração de Imposto de Renda in Brazil, and that would be considered. In some cases, there are no tax to be paid in Brazil, so it's quite good to look into the timing of when someone should no longer be tax resident, when someone should start to be tax resident here. And uh, one thing I would like to consider is that when we translate the word residence and domicile to Portuguese, we might understand domicilio. And in Portuguese, um, in, in Brazilian law, it's kind of, it's almost the same. So where someone is residence or domicile, there is no such a clear division between residence and domicile. Uh, and there are many interpretations. That In, uh, legislations and many ways of reading it. But in the UK is more clear cut, it's black and white. So we have a specific um, statutory residence test and we can tell if someone is tax resident in the UK or not. And the difference, the main difference between those two terms in English is that tax resident is a short term. So tax residence is year on year. Someone can be tax resident on a specific year. But domicile is a country that they have their permanent home, substantial connect. So for a lot of Brazilian investors in the UK, the domic their domicile will still be Brazil. It doesn't matter if they have done Brazilian tax exit, saída definitiva, or if they haven't. For UK purposes, this person may be tax resident here, but their domicile is still in Brazil. And that's a very attractive um, is a very attractive way to be taxed if uh, that's the case, because 
as a person that is tax resident here, but still have domicile in Brazil, you have choices into how you're going to be paying tax. And here are the choices. So a non-domiciled individual, the great, the vast majority of Brazilians invest in the UK or setting up business in the UK, they can choose if they want to be taxed on a rising basis, that's like worldwide income, or remittance basis. So they only tax on uh, remessas, remittances of income. So I've put things here on a table so we can uh, look into the advantages. I like to say that this is relevant because if someone chooses to invest in the UK and come to the UK, they need to consider the timing of when they're going to be tax resident in the UK. There's a lot of planning to do around that. So here, uh, someone UK resident and UK domiciled, so a British person born, raised, always lived here, they would be taxed on worldwide income. So it's similar to Brazil. Someone that lives in Brazil have a worldwide income, they would have, they would have to declare that to Receita Federal. So this scenario is similar to Brazilian, that you declare all income. But the great advantage here is someone who came to the UK, so someone tax resident in the UK, they came, they set up residence, they brought the family in the UK, but the domicile is still Brazil, so non-UK domicile, most of the Brazilian people in the first few years that they come here, they would be on this base. So they would be taxable in the UK in gains. Again, considering there are many reliefs in the UK, but it's just like they would have to declare they would be taxed, but they can choose the remittance base and they do not need to declare worldwide income. So if they still have a company in Brazil, they still have off uh, offshore income, they do not need to declare the income to the UK unless they bring the income here. So this goes very well in that uh, table that um, Gustav organized into how someone may be tax resident in the UK. Uh, they might have offshore income and they're not taxed either in Brazil or in the UK because of this regime. There are time limitations, but it's something that's widely used and we can certainly advise. Uh, and then if the remittance base does not apply or is not claimed, the worldwide income on a rising basis arrives. So if someone takes dividends, uh, then they would have to declare here. But most Brazilians that have offshore income, they choose to apply for the remittance basis. The scenario here would be for someone who is not UK resident. So uh, there is a clear calculation we can do to say how many nights, how many days someone can spend the UK to avoid being tax resident. So this is something we can we can advise uh, if they are investing in the UK and they need to come and work in the UK for you know, as a participation in that business, they can, as long as they know the number of days that they can stay in the UK, they can come and go and in that way, avoid being UK tax resident. If that's the case, then they would just be taxed on UK source of income and they would still benefit from all the reliefs that uh, Malcolm Joy and Jonathan Clark, Clark going to speak is very attractive still. Uh, and then they tax upon capital gains on disposal of properties, the things that are not really um, the topic of this discussion here. And again, someone not UK resident and not UK domicile, they are only taxed on UK source of income. And again, if they do pay tax in the UK, because they, that's the position, uh, they can declare this tax paid in the UK in Brazil and get relief in Brazil if this person is still Brazilian tax resident. Uh, so this is the same table, but just looking from a different scenario. So not taxed in the UK. So someone UK domicile, which would be Brazilians, they, the majority of Brazilians are, um, no, this is a UK domicile, British person uh, born in the UK and UK tax resident, they would be taxed in everything in the UK. Again, they would benefit from the reliefs, but overall they would be taxed, so it's not applicable. But that's the choice for Brazilians. Non-UK domiciled, a typical Brazilian person, the first six years that they come to the UK, and UK tax resident, if the remittance base is chosen, offshore income and gains are not taxable in the UK, provided they are not remitted. So they, they can plan around that. They can remit prior to becoming tax resident, or they can, they can consider uh, things that we can look. UK domicile, non-UK resident, not taxing UK on offshore income. And uh, a non-UK resident, non-UK domicile, they not tax on offshore income and gains. So the, the key point that I wanted to say is that, that although there is no double tax, no agreement to avoid double taxation, taxes paid in the UK on UK income can be used 
as a deduction in Brazil and vice versa. So tax deducted in Brazilian income can be used here if the person is resident. But for Brazilians, for the first six years, it can be more than six years, but the first six years are the, the best ones. Um, they can choose this. They can choose not to declare worldwide income as long as they don't bring it in. Um, okay, I hope this has been useful. Uh, and I, as I commented on the other side of this analysis on Brazil, uh, if the person wishes to remain Brazilian tax resident, I talk a lot about that on the blog. Okay. Fantastic. Fernanda, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's very nice to see uh, uh, organized all the possibilities um, worldwide taxation in UK, uh, how they interplay with this residence and domicile concept. Uh, now, without further ado, uh, I'll pass the mic to our, our colleagues uh, with Fred and Dieter. Um, uh, we'll have Jonathan Clark, the tax director in, the, in London, uh, and also Malcolm Joy, a tax partner in London, and they will share with us uh, their knowledge on the uh, rules existing in the UK uh, targeted to startups and their investors. Thank you very much, uh, Gustavo. Can I just make sure that my screen and voice is being heard for everyone? Yeah, it is. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you all today, and it's a pleasure for Fraser and Dieter to be part of this Brazilian Chamber of Commerce uh, webinar today. So we're here to talk about some of the tax incentives for startups and their investors. Uh, my name is Jonathan Clark, and you'll also be um, hearing from my colleague Malcolm Joy shortly. Uh, we both work for a firm called Fraser and Dieter, who are a UK and US tax accounting and advisory firm, and we specialise in SME entrepreneurial businesses, particularly ones that are looking to expand internationally. So whether that's a company in the UK looking to expand offshore or maybe a company outside of the UK, such as Brazil, looking to come into the UK. So uh, we have lots of clients in that kind of sphere, all kind of typically VC backed. Um, so huge amount of experience in this area and it's great to be talking with you. So what are the learning objectives of our um, brief session today? So firstly, we want to give an overview of some of the in, uh, attractive investment reliefs that are available to investors in the UK and that's termed as SEIS, EIS and VCT and I will cover that in a bit more detail. We're then going to look at some of the attractive stock option arrangements there are for employees in the UK, uh, and these can be very uh, beneficial ways of employers motivating their employees and the employees getting a very good uh, tax outcome from those stock options. And, and then my colleague Malcolm will be talking about some of the corporate tax reliefs available in the UK from the UK's R&D tax credit and patent box relief, so actual tax relief going back to the company. So three kind of areas, release for investors, release for employees and tax release for the company. So firstly, let's start with SEIS, EIS and VCT. So these are the three schemes that are termed uh, the venture capital tax relief schemes in the UK. Um, SEIS stands for Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme. Um, it's a scheme that's encouraged to invest, uh, a scheme that's encouraged to encourage in individuals to invest in small, very early stage unquoted trading companies. Then there's the Entre Enterprise Investment Scheme, EIS, which is to encourage individuals to invest in uh, early stage rather than small and very early stage unquoted trading companies. And then we have the Venture, Venture Capital Trust Scheme, uh, which is essentially a special investment vehicle that investors would invest in, and that vehicle in turn invests into the qualifying trading companies, similar to those of the SEIS and EIS stage. So why are investors so, uh, you know, why are UK investors always asking about SEIS, EIS and VCT? What's the benefits? So there's five main benefits to these various reliefs. The first and probably the most attractive, well, one of the most attractive is the income tax saving. So if you're an individual investor in the UK and you're investing in a qualifying SEIS, EIS or VCT company, you can get up to 50% or 30% income tax relief on your investment. So essentially you can cut the risk straight away initially on that investment you're making into a startup company. Another huge advantage is in the long term, if the company is qualifying and remains qualifying throughout the investment period, and we'll come on to that later, 
essentially the investor can uh, pay no capital gains tax on the disposal of those shares. So the company, if they invest in early to early stage and it does really well and it might float or be bought out by an M&A acquisition in the future, they can avoid capital gains tax in the UK. And then also there is loss relief if the investment isn't successful. Uh, they can defer other capital gains on their investment and they can also avoid dividends and distributions um, for PCTs. But the main one is the income tax saving and the capital gains tax relief that the investors are interested in. So how does your company uh, qualify for SEIS and EIS investment? Um, firstly, one of the most important conditions is the company must have a permanent establishment in the UK, and that is the parent company, so the company that would be issuing the shares to the investors. Um, so it would very much have to be you do some kind of UK flip or you put a UK parent company on top. Um, it is possible for a Brazilian company to open a branch in the UK and that to qualify as a UK permanent establishment, but whether that's actually beneficial from an operating perspective is something you'd need to look at in detail. Other things to consider is that the issuing company can't be controlled um, by any other company. So it's got to be independent and only owned by the shareholders and not another company. Uh, and also it's got to conduct a qualifying trade. Um, and the legislation in the UK doesn't say what a qualifying trade is. It just says what isn't a qualifying trade. Uh, and that's typically dealing in land, banking, insurance, legal accounting services. So anything kind of tech, trading, um, commerce related is very much going to qualify for this type of relief. Um, if it is a group company, um, if it has going to have a subsidiary in Brazil, um, it's got to own at least 90% of the equity in that uh, Brazilian subsidiary. And all the money that you're raising from investors has to be used for that qualifying business activity, i.e. your trade. It can't be used to pay out a dividend or to um, you know, uh, buy another company that's not qualifying. So they're the kind of the main conditions for your company to qualify. I'm just on this slide, I'm just putting together some numbers um, in terms of your stage and what size the company can be to qualify. Um, there's some various thresholds. So SEIS being the very early stage, in order to qualify, the group can't have more than 200,000 pounds sterling of assets. Um, so that's why I talked about that being geared at very early stage companies. If that's not available to you, then most companies would look at EIS, which has a much higher threshold of 15 million. Uh, and then there's other criteria of the number of employees you have, 25, up to 25, up to 250, how long you've been trading, all kind of making sure that you're that early stage startup company, which this whole relief is um, geared at. And there's also kind of limits on the amounts you can raise per year and in a lifetime, so up to five million pounds per year with EIS, which is a, you know, a huge amount that can be raised in 12 million in a lifetime. Just touching on the qualifying period, if you do um, take on investors for SEIS and EIS and, VC, uh, and VCT, typically you need to continue to meet all the qualifying conditions for the qualifying period. So you can't just meet it from day one and then forget all the rules from day two. The qualifying period is three years and providing the qualifying period is met, your investor gets all the income tax relief and capital gains tax relief they were expecting from their initial investment. OK, so that's a high level overview of EIS and SEIS. I'm now going to move on to the employee incentives and what we commonly refer to it here in the UK is EMI, which stands for Enterprise Management Incentive Stock Option Arrangement. And this is one of the UK's tax advantaged employee stock option, option schemes, and it's very much geared up for SME companies. Now, what it allows employers to do is grant shares in their company to their employees. And the advantage of this scheme is that there's no tax at grant, no tax at vest and no tax at exercise, providing the conditions are met. So it's a very tax efficient way of giving equity to your employees. And essentially, it means that when the employee exercises their stock option in the future, there might there'll be no tax to pay and they would only eventually have to pay capital gains tax in the UK when they sell those shares. Uh, and that's if they're UK tax resident at the time. Uh, and that capital gains tax is up to 10 percent on the first one million. So a very low rate of tax. Uh, and it's a very common scheme for startups here in the UK that um, typically these startup companies can't afford to pay high salaries. So 
so they will pay a good salary and they will motivate and they will uh, incentivize their employees with equity in the company. Um, and essentially that uh, equity can have a very beneficial rate that eventually any growth in the company, they only pay 10% capital gains tax when they sell. The comparison, um, if you were not to do an EMI scheme and you were to do an unapproved stock option scheme in the UK, employees could be paying up to 48%, um, you know, close to 48% on those, um, on the increase in their equity. So 10% to 48% is a huge, uh, huge tax saving for employees. How to be a qualifying company? Actually, this isn't too hard. Um, there's not, the conditions aren't too strict like SEIS and EIS. Essentially, the company has to be independent. So again, you can't be controlled by another company. Um, there's no requirement for the, the parent company to be in the UK, but the group needs a permanent establishment, either a subsidiary or a branch. Um, and all the company subsidiaries, again, must be qualifying trading companies, so not doing excluded activities that we touched on before. And the two kind of thresholds are that the gross assets of the company can't be more than 30 million, and the can't, company can't have more than 250 employees at the date the options are granted. So again, looking at those startup SME company sizes. Um, in terms of compliance actions for the company, the only things you need to think about with EMI is getting an EMI scheme drafted in accordance with the rules, which is relatively straightforward to do with your lawyers. Uh, and then it's three steps, which is essentially you need to agree evaluation with the tax authorities prior to granting stock options. And that effectively sets the strike price that you, you can use to get the tax um, tax advantage rates. You've got to notify the tax authorities once you've granted options to employees and you just need to commit an annual return telling the revenue about options that have been exercised during the year. And that's just an information return, so no tax associated with that at all. How, uh, how and which employees are eligible for EMI? Uh, well, firstly, the employee, uh, someone has to be an employee. They can't be a contractor. Um, directors are eligible and they have to meet the working time requirement, which is essentially the employee needs to spend at least 25 hours per week working for your company. Or if they're a part time employee, at least 75 percent of their total working time working for your company and the employee can't already hold more than 30 percent of the equity in the company. So again, it's not designed for founders. Um, it's only designed for employees. Um, conditions for the EMI options. It's got to be ordinary shares that you're granting. You've got the employees got to be able to exercise the option within 10 years. And there's a, a value of 250,000 per employee in terms of the value of the equity they can be awarded in the company at grants. And there's a maximum limit of 3 million for the company in terms of the number of options it can grant. So hopefully that gives you a good high level overview of EMI options available to employees. What I'm going to do now is hopefully um, smoothly hand over to my colleague Malcolm, who's going to talk about some of the UK company R&D tax credit reliefs. Thanks very much, Johnny, and uh, hello, everyone. Nice to uh, be here with you today. As Johnny just mentioned there, I'm also with Fraser and Dieter in the UK. Uh, I'm more focused on the corporate tax side of things. I'm just going to talk about uh, two of the main reliefs that we have in the UK that are available to uh, Brazilian or other overseas uh, companies that are investing in the UK and that I think make the UK very attractive for um, uh, entrepreneurial, uh, particularly tech companies that have a lot of um, innovation, a lot of uh, IP development type activity taking place in the UK. And it's a very deliberate uh, part of the UK tax regime to attract that kind of business. Um, so the, the first area I'm going to talk about is our regime in the UK for research and development tax credits. Uh, and that's actually broken down into two separate uh, R&D tax schemes. The first one is known as the SME scheme, and the second one is known as the RDEC scheme, or sometimes referred to as the, the large company, company scheme. Uh, the SME scheme is, is by far the much more generous of the two. Uh, we've got a slide later on which just uh, sets out the kind of benefits that you can achieve. Uh, from carrying out activity in the UK that, that, that qualifies for the SME scheme. Uh, but it's only open to small and medium sized enterprises. For these purposes, we are defining small or medium sized as anyone with fewer than 500 employees worldwide and group turnover of less than a million, sorry, 100 million euros or a balance sheet total of less than 86 million euros. Uh, so it still captures quite a lot of um, uh, companies. 
Uh, and what we do is it, for every um, £100 of spend, we allow an additional tax deduction of £130 on top of the £100. So we get, we get a, a tax deduction of £230 for a um, £100 spend. Uh, now, that if you're a profitable company in the UK, then you can just offset that against your uh, taxable profits and, and pay a lower amount of tax. Uh, however, and, and this is where it's uh, particularly attractive for earlier stage businesses, you can use this as a source of funding. So what the government allows you to do is to surrender that 230 tax loss for a cash payment from the government equal to 14.5% of that 230 tax loss. So that's a very generous uh, regime. It's uh, often used by uh, early stage tech companies uh, in the UK. Uh, as a means of upon the means of financing the operations. Now, as, as you might imagine, with something that generous, there are uh, a number of conditions attached to it. I won't go through all of those uh, conditions today. Uh, but for a, an overseas company looking at setting something up in the UK, so a Brazilian parented company looking to, uh, to, to carry out some uh, qualifying research and development type activity, uh, in the UK, it is possible to benefit from this regime, but there needs to be a degree of autonomy around the R&D activity is taking place in the UK for this very generous SME scheme to apply. So it can't just be a kind of a, uh, uh, stuff that's funded from uh, the parent company in Brazil uh, and recharged um, uh, back to the, 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 the parent company. Uh, any other type of R&D that doesn't fall within the SME scheme, so either the company is too big or it's the wrong type of R&D, it can still benefit from the, the RDEC scheme. And what, what the, uh, how the scheme works is we give a, a, a tax credit above the line in uh, the accounts, which is equal to 13% um, of the qualifying costs. But that tax credit itself is subject to tax uh, in the UK at the normal rates. And again, we've got a slide later on which just shows how those numbers play out. One of the uh, attractive features about both of the schemes in the UK is that we have a very broad definition of qualifying activity. Basically, if a company is trying to do anything where it doesn't fully know how to do it at the source of the project, then there's a really good likelihood that it would qualify for the uh, either of those two uh, uh, tax uh, reliefs. Uh, it would apply to software developments as well as other types of um, R&D activity, which I know is, is more generous than a lot of other countries uh, with their R&D regimes. Uh, the, the costs that are eligible are mostly staff costs, externally provided workers and consumables. Um, there are some uh, slightly confusing rules about subcontracted costs, but you can get a percentage of those allowable as well. Uh, the, the, the system's been with us now for over 20 years. It's a very well established part of the UK um, tax uh, system, but we keep tinkering with it. Every year there are changes uh, around uh, and being uh, debated. At the moment, the latest changes to come in were uh, came in last year for companies. Um, there is a cap on the amounts paid back under the SME scheme, which is linked to the, um, the, the, the cost of the employment uh, in the UK. Um, but that can still be, uh, there, are, there are provisions where you can avoid that cap if you have senior people in the UK who are responsible for the development of the, the IP. And then there are more proposed changes coming through next year. We're waiting to see the details on those, but they would uh, provide more of a geographic limitation on the costs that could qualify. Uh, thanks, John, if you want to move on to the next slide. So I, as promised, this is a, just a, a quick summary of, of the benefits. So the situation we're looking at is uh, a company that's carrying out qualifying spend of £200,000 uh, in the UK. And then we're looking at it under three different headings. Firstly, if it's a qualifying SME, which is loss making. Second column is if it's a profit making SME. And the third column is where the company doesn't qualify as an SME or the spend doesn't qualify for the SME scheme. And we're just claiming it under the RDEC large company scheme. So if we just look at those quickly, we, we see that, we, um, that we've got 200,000 to spend in the first column. We get an additional 260 uh, given to us by the SME scheme, which means we've got a total tax deduction now of 460 on a 200 spend. 
Uh, and the amount that we can get back from the government as a payable credit, 14.5% of that if we're loss making. So the government will actually pay us £66,700 uh, for spending £200,000 on R&D. So it's, it's a good source of funding. That gives us an effective tax saving of 33.35%. It's not quite as big as the, the effective saving we get if we're a profit making SME, where we, we just get the 460000 as a deduction against our um, uh, corporation tax bill, uh, and that gives us an effective 43.7% saving. Uh, the RDEX scheme is slightly less generous, so we're only getting a 13% uh, credit, 26,000, which is itself subject to tax, so we effectively come out with a 10% a benefit on that. And then finally, Johnny, if we can move to the, the next slide, just a very quick overview of the other regime, which I think is very attractive for overseas companies investing in the UK. This is our UK patent box regime, which has been uh, talked about a lot. Um, it effectively gives us a rate of tax of 10% on income derived from anything linked to a patent, which has been uh, generated by a UK company. Um, so there's, there's uh, a lot of conditions again around this. We had to um, uh, change the rules uh, a few years ago after they were originally brought in uh, because of concerns from some other com uh, countries, particularly Germany, around whether or not they constituted harmful tax um, competition. Uh, so we, we've, we've tweaked it a bit. We have to monitor the spend to make sure that the spend uh, is mostly incurred and the risks taken by the UK company. But it is very broad in its definition that one of the examples that the guidance gives on this is if you have a printer uh, where the printer has some patented element to it, um, you can claim uh, the patent box regime for the whole uh, income from sales of the printers. But you could also, if you're selling uh, replacement ink cartridges for those printers, even if the ink cartridges themselves don't have any patented items in them, uh, then the 10% regime will also apply to the revenue derived from the uh, the sale of those cartridges. Um, so just a quick summary there of two of the, 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 the quite generous um, tax reliefs we have in the UK for entrepreneurial businesses setting up here. Thank, Thank you very much, Malcolm, and also Jonathan, on this fantastic eye-opener on what, what can be achieved if, if policymakers do realise the potential that uh, small and, and medium enterprises can bring for the economy on innovation and technological development. Um, uh, okay, so um, may, uh, can I ask my uh, tax committee colleague, uh, uh, Luis Felipe Centeno Ferraz, uh, to perhaps help us with the Q&A session? Sure. Thank you, Gustavo. I have one uh, one question before I go through uh, some questions here. Uh, one question that I had, and I was wondering if uh, one of you could cover, would be the non-existence of a tax treaty between U.S. U.S. Uh, sorry, U.K. and and Brazil. Uh, I understand that this is uh, has been a demand forever, and we don't have any. Uh, forecast for this i don't know if you and i understand that the the the, the tax treaty between two countries it really assists uh, the interaction between the both countries it, it really uh, uh develops or uh, assists the development of a commercial relationship so I, I would like to know if you can uh um discuss on that and if there is any expectation for this and how that would uh, increment all these uh, uh commercial relationships that we're talking about Okay, um, I don't know if anyone else is going to talk, but I don't think it's very advanced on that sense. And it would definitely help because the fact that there is no treaty, we have those circumstances that someone is tax resident in both countries or not tax resident in either of those countries. There are instances that um, there are taxes paid in the UK that we can't deduct in Brazil or vice versa. So it would really help. And also on the... Um, uh, in terms of pensions, because there is no tax treaty, someone may pay ta maybe 15 years of pension in the UK and then they pay 15 years of pension in Brazil and there is no interaction with that. So it's really a shame that there is no uh, tax treaty between both countries, but at least they do have this uh, relief, which uh, Brazil does not have, have many countries that Brazil does not allow this relief. 
Um, I would love to be involved in a tax treaty, but um, I don't think it's uh, that advanced. I just add my comments as well. I, one of the areas where I see it being a concern is in transfer pricing. One of the key things for businesses operating internationally is if they're generating profits, they want to make sure their profits are only taxed once. And the question of who has the taxing rights is often addressed by the tax treaty in terms of um, uh, in making sure there's no uh, economic double taxation. Without the tax treaty, there is there is a uh, genuine concern among, amongst businesses that some of the profits may end up uh, being caused by both tax systems. OK, uh, thank you. And uh, I have a, a question here from Juliana Antoniolo. He'd like to know some something about the uh, where to be installed. Is it mandatory for the start, startup to be installed in the UK initially? And this is something I don't know. I don't I know. I wonder if someone can ask answer this. Oh, if I may, uh, if I may, uh, um, of course, uh, Jonathan and Malcolm can uh, uh, share their, their views on this. But from uh, there is for the CAS scheme, uh, there's a requirement of a new business that uh, the company must be operating up to two years. Uh, so, in principle, it's not necessary to have the operational entity incorporated in UK. It can be incorporated in, in Brazil and by, by means of either a subsidiary or of a UK parent to be in place and then to tap into the uh, incentive there. Uh, uh, this, can, this can happen afterwards. However, uh, in the time frame of two years, if the, the intention is to uh, enjoy the, uh, the CIS scheme. Is that right, guys? Uh, yeah, that's correct, Gustavo. So um, it, it all depends how long the company's been going and what relief we're trying to achieve. But, you know, you don't have to be incorporated in the UK from day one to access all the reliefs we've talked about, but some you might not qualify for. But it doesn't mean there are others you would. So um, I wouldn't see it as a massive disadvantage if it, you weren't incorporated in the UK from day one. I see. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, of course, if any other questions might arise, uh, this the recording of this session will be available at the website of the Brazilian Chamber, and uh, our uh, contact details are there, have been uh, shown on uh, on the on our presentation. So, trying to keep the schedule tight, uh, let me please invite Julia Koch from uh, with the DIT Department for International Trade of the British Government. Uh, to say uh, some uh, brief words as closing remarks. Julia, would you mind? Thank you so much, Gustavo. Amazing uh, presentations today. It's good that we can always learn new things and, and try to understand also how our companies can best fit with the uh, incentives that the British government is offering. Uh, I, if I may say just a, a brief um, um, thing about the entrepreneur program, I saw that Giuliano also asked uh, about the entrepreneur program and you do not need to have your company established uh, in the UK yet to participate in this program. Actually, the idea is that the company uh, is outside the UK, so the entrepreneur program can support the company to establish headquarters uh, in the UK um, and thank you so much uh, for, for being uh, present uh, today. I count uh, on uh, Frazier and Diti and also on Fernanda to uh, support your business to establish in the UK also with the Brazilian uh, Chamber, Gustavo, Vera and if uh, your company is a Brazilian company that also wants to be connected with the British government uh, in Brazil, please notice that any company can uh, get in touch with us to receive free and uh, confidential uh, support to go through this journey. And we, as British government, can also connect you to this uh, amazing partner, such as the ones that we saw uh, speaking today. So um, I think uh, this uh, this is from uh, my side. Gustavo, thank you so much for, for inviting us today. Our privilege, uh, Julia. Uh, fantastic to have the rest of the IT with us today. Fantastic presentations from Fernanda Ellis, from uh, the Malcolm and uh, Jonathan, with the uh, Fraser Dieter. Uh, so well, I think uh, that's uh, that's it for this session today. We look forward for uh, we look forward to having you uh, and all of uh, everyone attending joining us on our next uh, webinar. We're planning a couple of events uh, for September, October. Possibly discussion on the tax, double tax treaty. This is a, a matter that's getting some uh, traction now again after Brexit, 
and also we do consider discussing uh, tax ESG, namely sustainable taxation, cooperative compliance, how relationship between tax administration and taxpayers can improve and develop and what are the trends there. So thanks everyone again. Look forward for the next session. Best Gustavo, Take just care. one thing, just one thing. Uh, uh, Giuliano has just asked if the presentation will be available. I don't know if you know that. Yes, yes, it will be uh, uh, made available uh, the session, the recording of the session at the uh, Brazilian Chamber of Commerce in Great Britain's website in a couple of days time. So please check there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. Bye everyone. Thank you so much. Next time we'll see you again. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye.